Welcome back, my friends, to the Feeling Forward podcast. I am so excited to introduce you to the one and only Ben Azadi, founder of the Keto Camp, and one of really like the main people in the industry that's getting into biohacking and teaching people how to be successful on a ketogenic diet, how to do intermittent fasting correctly, and really just helping you find the root cause to your problem, not just treating the symptoms, but as Ben says, it's true health care, not just sick care. So let's get right into it. Ben Azadi, welcome to the podcast, my friend. Niku, grateful to be here with you and your awesome audience. Thanks for having me. Of course. So I want to dive right in and hear about your feeling forward story, because I know it all started back in 2008. You had an incredible story that was even years before that. I mean, you you pushed the start button in 08, but what was happening prior to that? What were you going through physically, mentally, and emotionally? And how did you get to that turning point? I followed a standard American diet, like a lot of people are following, which is really a stupid American diet, which it's not about health. It's about profit, essentially. So I grew up here in Miami Beach, Florida. My parents immigrated here from Iran in the 70s. I was born in 1984. My parents uh, divorced and I was left to my own devices growing up. So here in Miami Beach, I hung out with the wrong crowd, ate the wrong foods, got into addictions and just a bad environment. So I was very much unhealthy growing up. I was one of those kids, bullied, picked on, wearing t-shirts inside of swimming pools, very bad self-confidence, low self-esteem. And that transferred into my adulthood where I found myself back in 2008, like you mentioned, 24 years old, depressed, suicidal, wanting to give up on my life, unhealthy, 250 pounds, so physically obese, but also mentally obese and bankrupt. I was broke. I was broken. I wanted to just give up on life because I was hurting every single day. But what changed for me was actually starting to read books. A friend of mine handed me a book, which really helped open up my eyes, which led to a second book and a third book. And I started to fall in love with these incredible authors like Bob Proctor, Lisa Nichols, Earl Nightingale, Jim Rohn. I mean, Dr. Wayne Dyer, so many incredible authors. The main thing the books did for me was help me for the first time in my life, take responsibility and ownership. And that word responsibility is so important right now in this day and age for people to understand what that word actually means. That is your ability to respond to life. That is responsibility. My ability to respond to life up until that point was poor. I was the victim of my history, blaming my genetics, blaming my enabling family members, blaming whatever I could get my hands on. But the truth of the matter is that I am responsible. I was responsible and I still am. So I instantly said those words out loud. I am responsible. And in that second, I became the victor of my destiny, no longer the victim of my history. And I started to eat better. I started to think better. I started to exercise. Fast forward nine months, I lost 80 pounds, went from 34% body fat down to 6% body fat. So I finally transformed my physical appearance and I carved out a physical six pack. But the most important thing that I achieved during the transformation was a mental six pack. I started to really get intentional with my thoughts and the consciousness and how important those thoughts are to your health and your future. And that's what just got me started in my journey 12, 13 years ago. Along the way, became a certified personal trainer, opened up a CrossFit gym, sold the CrossFit gym, and then became certified as a functional health practitioner and started Keto Camp. And our mission here at Keto Camp is to educate and to inspire a billion people so they could become aware of how incredible their body is and how it is capable of healing. And we'll talk more about how we can do that. I love that. And I want to really dive into the specific certification that you got. It's functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner. So it's looking at the body holistically as a whole, diagnosing the root cause issue, not just the systematic issue or the symptomatic issue, but the root cause issue, and then using food to help heal some of those issues, which is pretty incredible because some people think, oh, nutritionist, oh, okay. There's a health coach, right? But there's nothing to be said about the very specific certification that you got. Well said. You said that really good. Functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner. A lot of people fumble over that. So I'm impressed. Yeah, exactly. It's about being a health detective, essentially, and empowering other people to be their own health detective because there are hidden things that's interfering with the body and the capability of the body to heal itself. 
And what I learned in FDN is exactly that. How do you identify these hidden stressors? So yes, functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner is the certification. And then along the way, I uh, became uh, I opened my I became familiar with the work of Dr. Daniel Pampa, who is one of the leaders in the health space, focusing on cellular health and detoxification. And now I work with him and a team of 40 plus doctors. So we we see what's going on with the research, and then we apply it clinically, and then we come to our own kind of synergy and conclusions. Oh, amazing. So we're going to be talking about mitochondria today, cell autophagy, really getting deep diving into all of that. But before we go into that depth of it, I want to talk about one specific thing. When you told your story, you said 13 plus years ago, you were dealing with a lot of self-limiting beliefs, a lot of negative thoughts, right? This cycle of just we're in our head and we're not we're not feeding ourselves the best things that we can from a mental standpoint. And you were dealing with some suicidal thoughts. I know a lot of people right now that are struggling. They're struggling with their mindset and their mental health. What are some of the things that you did that really helped you regain control of your thoughts? Because when it gets really bad to that point where now we're, we're dealing with the suicidal thoughts and things of that nature, it's hard to regain control. It's like we've been overcome by this negative cycle. How did you break that cycle? And what are some things that people can do that might be dealing with that to kind of step forward into the place where now they have control and they could actually start to work on other aspects of their health? It's a very important question, especially in this day and age. I mean, we've seen suicide and depression skyrocket in the last 18 to 20 months since everything started to happen in the world. Even before that, it was it was bad. And now it's even worse. Uh, and it's very sad to kind of see those stats and hear about uh, people who take their own lives because I've been there looking on the Internet. How, you know, how do I kill myself? What are the quickest ways to end my life, et cetera? And then stopping myself because I kept thinking about my mom. Uh, thank God for that, because I think I would have done it if I didn't have my mom in my life. And just I, I just kept thinking about what she would have to deal with if I took my life. But it was months where it was that vicious cycle, searching for ways to end my life, stopping myself, searching and stopping. So what, what, what helped for me was to really understand the thoughts that we think. It's so important. I, I believe we get what we think about most of the time. And those are those 60,000 daily thoughts that we have every single day. Those are a lot of thoughts. A lot of people are not creating original thoughts. They're just on autopilot. It's these learned behaviors, these paradigms that they adopted during essentially the first seven years of their life. And it's downloaded into their hardware and they're not really creating any original thoughts. It's estimated that 90% of somebody's 60,000 thoughts they're going to think today are the same thoughts from the day before. And that's called your paradigm. It's a multitude of habits. It's in your subconscious mind. And there's two ways to change your paradigm. The first way is an emotional impact, okay? We don't want to go that route. So I'll give you an example. An emotional impact was 9-11. We just had the 20-year uh, anniversary of 9-11. A lot of people knew family members, friends, or colleagues that worked at 9-11 or firefighters or whatever, whoever was involved with it who lost their lives. And that's an emotional impact if you know somebody who lost their lives during 9-11 and that will change the way you think. That'll change the way you live. It'll change that paradigm. So if you lose a loved one, like I lost my dad, that was a paradigm shift for me. So that's the first way to change those habits, that you, those thoughts. It's, a, it's an emotional impact. We don't want to go that route because there's a, lot, there's a lot of pain in that route. The second option is the better option. And that's just consistent uh, conscious awareness and repetition. So repetition. So we think about those thoughts, 60,000 thoughts what if we could change those thoughts to have thoughts that serve us and, and serve our health and our relationships and our future? We could do that. I believe that's the greatest power as a human being. We have the ability to consciously change our thoughts. Dr. Wayne Dyer said, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. So what I started to do is every time I had a negative thought, what I call a stinking thinking thought, I would let that thought pass kind of like a, a cloud with lightning pass. And then I would choose a better thought. So it could be a thought like I hate myself and I would be aware that I'm thinking that. And I would let that thought pass, acknowledge it and just, and start saying, I love, love myself. I love myself. I love me. I am loved. And a lot of people think affirmations are silly and woo woo. Affirmations have absolutely changed my life because I've been very consistent with them. When I walk my dog here in my neighborhood, I'm not listening to music. I'm actually saying affirmations in my head all day long. I'm writing them down in my notepad all day long. So it's that conscious 
rep rep uh, repetitive act of changing those thoughts. And that's number one. What else is going to be important is to change your environment because you become your environment. As you know, if you hang around people who are gossiping, who are talking about the news, who are very negative, you're going to be the next person to talk about that. But when you change your environment and hang around people who are actually abundant thinkers, expressing gratitude and thinking about what we can do to help other people, you're going to follow along with that. So changing your environment, doing an audit on who in your life is supporting you or who's draining you and spending more time with who's supporting you, uh, that could help. But the bottom line is this. If your thinking is stinking, your dreams are shrinking. Okay, health dreams, relationship dreams, every everything is manifested from your thoughts. If you see it in your mind, you hold it in your hand. So just become really conscious with the thoughts that you're thinking and just choose a better thought. Just get 1% better each day and, and stack daily habits. You don't have to go big or go home all at once. Small little tweaks will lead to giant peaks. And that's what I did. And I still continue to do that to this day. Small little tweaks will lead to giant peaks. I love that. And I want to repeat what you said. If your thinking is stinking, then your dreams are shrinking. So you're literally getting rid of the joy, the beauty, the, the glory of life. Like you're, you're dimming your own light, your fire. So really being conscious of your thoughts, not getting stuck on a thought, letting the thoughts pass, and then doing things like meditation. If you can't just sit there and silence yourself, do a guided meditation. There's plenty of them out there. Just search YouTube, guided meditation for relaxation guided meditation for sleep, guided meditation for depression, whatever it is. And there's plenty of resources out there, but don't sit in isolation because it's an isolation that we become more depressed and we start to kind of dig a hole that's deeper. And you got to reach out. You got to connect right now. More than ever connection is so vital to helping those of us that are really struggling with our mental health. So I want to just touch on that. No, you well said. Uh, absolutely. And, and it's important to understand for those listening that you you're important, you matter. I mean, I believe in God and God didn't create junk. Every single human being is a masterpiece. I, I always say this, you are a, a masterpiece, because you're a piece of the master. You're, you're one of God's ideas. And look, if you don't believe in God, just substitute a word for like universe or love. You're, you're one of the universe's ideas. And God wants to do it through you. The universe wants to do it through you. It's not, they're not going to do it for you, but you matter your love, surround your people, surround yourself with people who are going to see that in you because we see it in you. Every single human being is a masterpiece and don't let anybody tell you anything otherwise. Don't fall victim to the fear and the scarcity. I believe abundance is our birthright and we have so much abundance in this world, no matter what you're going through this too shall pass and it's all on the way it's not in the way but it really starts with those thoughts and if you think it's woo woo i'll just quickly share some research from dr bruce lipton who i interviewed on my keto camp podcast he wrote an amazing book called the biology of belief and he's a world-renowned cell biologist he brought the research into the world on what thoughts actually do to create disease or create health and he has proven that your thoughts are a frequency, a sound wave that actually penetrates your cells. And there's receptor sites on your cells that allow these frequencies to get inside of your cells and communicate with your DNA. If it's a negative thought, a fearful thought, a hateful thought, it'll tell your DNA to produce a specific protein that is inflammatory that can lead to disease. If it is a healthy, abundant, loving, grateful thought, it'll communicate to the DNA to produce a healthy protein that leads to health just with your thoughts. So it's going to be important to become consciously aware and start shifting that stinking thinking to loving, abundant thoughts. I love that. And as we're talking about that, changing the thoughts will also change how our cells are programmed. But let's go back to people that are struggling with how they're feeling. Let's talk to the postpartum mother who's dealing with postpartum depression as a result of a huge hormonal shift and change and imbalance, right? Post baby. There's a lot of ways that we can actually balance our hormones naturally and holistically void of just medication. Not to say that there's a time and a place for medication, but there's a lot of other things that we, we can be doing before, during, after. So let's kind of deep dive into nutritionally. What are some things that we can all be doing to help us with our hormones and then going into intermittent fasting? Because 
It okay. starts with the thoughts. The thoughts are going to help us reprogram the cells, but then there's a lot of other things that we can be doing with food and with our habits and our lifestyle choices to help us balance our hormones naturally. And I know you're the expert, so I'm going to yeah. pass you the mic for this. Yeah. Another great question. You're a great host. Um, so food you eat is so important. The food you eat will determine the thoughts that you think. If you think about somebody who's eating a standard American diet, very, the average American is eating about 300 to 400 grams of carbohydrates every single day. If you're doing that and eating very frequently, snacking, grazing throughout the day, high carbohydrate foods, you're going to get glucose response, glucose drop, glucose response, glucose drop, which is going to lead to more cravings, anxiety, maybe even more depression, uh, because your, your, your brain is not going to be stable with all those glucose hits. What we want to do is change the food that we're eating and eat more healthy fat and protein to stabilize your glucose, stabilize your insulin. And then if you get into ketosis, which I love as, as a powerful tool, now the brain is running on ketones, which it loves. If you think about the brain, it's mostly fat. 70% or so is made up of fat. That's why babies, by the way, babies that are breastfed are actually in ketosis. And I believe burning fat is our primal birthright. And you think about how is that even possible? Well, breast milk has saturated fat, has cholesterol. Yeah, there's sugar in it, but the baby's so efficient at burning that sugar. It goes in and out of ketosis, which, which helps the development of the baby's brain, which is mostly fat. So if we could get you into ketosis, eat more healthy fat and protein, less carbohydrates, you're going to think better thoughts. It's going to help with your mood. It's going to help with your depression and your anxiety. So that's a place that I would start right there. So let's, let's play the devil's advocate. I'm also a yoga teacher and in the yoga community, it's very, very, um, encouraged that you, you kind of get rid of eating all the animal products, right? No more eggs, no more meat, and really get more towards eating the plants and being a little bit more vegetarian or vegan. So let's talk about some of the deficiencies that are happening with vegetarians, with vegans, what they're missing in their diet. And then let's also talk about this kind of myth that's going on where people are saying, if you're eating animal food, specifically red meat, it's causing heart disease and cholesterol issues. And it's going to actually lead to you dying younger. Let's hit mm. both sides of the coin. Yeah. You know, there's the, it's the diet wars. It's the diet wars. I, I've been dogmatic before and I, and I aim not to, and I don't think I am, but I, I want to catch myself if I become dogmatic again. I was a vegan for a year and a half back in 2012, 2013. I read the China study, didn't know how to really understand studies. So the book tricked me and I became a strict vegan for a year and a half. And it, and it actually was great in the beginning. And then all of a sudden uh, it, it depleted my hormones, depleted my health. And then that's when I transitioned and I found keto and fasting. I think all diets work just not long-term, okay? That goes for the vegan diet, that goes for the keto diet, that goes for the paleo diet, that goes for the carnivore diet. Let's think about how our ancestors lived. And no, we shouldn't do everything our ancestors did. Of course not. But every single one of our ancestors changed their diet. They all did keto. They all ate animal products. But when they didn't have animal products and they had a whole bunch of fruit and vegetables, they ate that, but they rotated their foods. It's the variation, it's the change that forces the body to adapt, which creates more diversity in the gut, and it helps your mitochondria become stronger and your cells become stronger. That's the way we are hardwired to live. So I love a vegan diet. I love a vegetarian diet short term. When you do that too long, of course, there's going to be a lot of vitamins and minerals you're going to begin to deplete. Plants, and veg uh, plants vegetables, and fruit have anti-nutrients in them. All right. It's important for vegans to understand it. And look, I'm not against the vegans. I think you're, it's great. It's admirable, admirable not to want to contribute to tortured animals. I agree with you, but plants have anti-nutrients in them. Why do they, what does that mean? And why do they have them? Well, when you think about back in the day, when there was plants and animals, animals like bears or dogs or whatever it is, they have the ability to defend themselves with their teeth and their claws, or they could run away. That, that was their defense mechanism. Animals have that, humans have that. Plants don't have that option. Plants don't have teeth, they don't have legs. So they had to develop a defense mechanism so their species could survive. And they did that through these, what's called plant toxins, anti-nutrients. So when a predator ate the plant, the vegetable, the predator got sick and the predator would not eat that plant again. 
these are these are anti-nutrients lectins phytates oxalates there's like over 50 of them i talk about them in my book now when you eat them all the time for an extended period of time it's those anti-nutrients are going to create inflammation in your gut it's going to poke holes in your gut leading to leaky gut and if you keep doing it it could lead to autoimmune disease as well plus a lot of the vitamins and minerals in the plants are not even being absorbed by the body because of these anti-nutrients so that's one reason why it's great for a period of time to remove them and then bring them back in because short term they could benefit you long term they won't but what about meats your question was does red meat lead to cancer and heart disease if you look at all the studies out there it's the studies that are looking at conventional raised animals and feedlots that lead to disease it's the animals that are pumped full of anti uh, not antioxidants it's a, definitely not that pumped full of medication and fed grains that are GMO and pesticides and herbicides, we eat that and then we get disease. But when I talk about animal products, I'm talking about animals that were uh, raised in a healthy way, feeding, a, eating a natural diet on a sustainably sor sourced a farm. There's nothing that shows that could lead to disease. And in fact, that could reduce your risk of heart disease. I'll give you a perfect example. I did a year ago, over a year ago, 40 days, four zero days of a carnivore diet where I ate nothing but animal fat, saturated fat, cholesterol from animal products for 40 days straight. On day one, I did a whole set of lab work, $3,500 panel of lab work, inflammatory markers, HDL, LDL, A1C, thyroid panel. I did a whole set of lab markers, and then I did 40 days of carnivore. On day 40, before I broke carnivore, I did the same lab work on day 40. And I wanted to see, did it risk, did it increase my risk of heart disease? Did I see some crazy things there? I actually saw my lab work transform. I'll give you one marker that I'm thinking about. A high sensitivity C-reactive protein. Most doctors will look at that. And it even says on your lab report, this is assessing your risk of a cardiovascular event. So heart attack or stroke, it's called C-reactive protein. On day one, my C-reactive protein was 1.1, which is pretty good. On day 40 of eating nothing but animals, my C-reactive protein went to 0.5, okay? It cut it in half, over half, which flies in the face of conventional wisdom. All of my inflammatory markers dropped, my insulin improved, my A1C improved. Uh, so it transformed my lab work. The, the, the goal is to do it yourself and see if it works for you. But if you're eating animal products that are quality, high quality, grass fed, grass finished, it's going to reduce inflammation. So I think there's a time and place for carnivore and for keto and for plant-based, but it's a short-term approach, not a long-term approach for any of these. Amen. You hit it on the head, organic grass fed, grass finished, make sure that it's, it's good quality meats. And as long as you're putting good quality foods into your system. I mean, if you look at us ancestrally, we were, we were raised eating meat products and it's important for getting us into that state of ketosis to help us with our brain function. And I also try the carnivore diet again for a short period of time for six weeks, right? Not for my whole life. And what I realized is someone that was dealing with chronic bloating, chronic inflammation, my bloating completely went away. My inflammatory markers also completely decreased my brain function and my, just like my, my clarity, my ability to make decisions more effectively and efficiently. And I just, I felt so good. I wake up in the morning and I felt energetic and vital. I'd eat meals and I would feel satiated, not still hungry or craving. And I wasn't snacking all day. So yeah, I mean, I love what you said about try it and see how it feels and works for you. But the most important thing when it comes to those animal products is that they are, they're clean, they're organic, they're grass fed and they're grass finished. That's correct. That's awesome about your carnivore experience. I've, I've heard so many anecdotal stories like that as it transforms your gut, gives your gut a big reset because you eliminate the anti-nutrients. So your gut just heals itself. So that's so cool. Awesome. Share. Yeah. It's like you said, Ben, I mean, it really helped me with healing my SIBO. It helped me with rebalancing my hormones and it helped me actually break out of postpartum depression, which is something that I dealt with after wow. I had my son. So definitely it's a, it's a big one for people that are trying to rebalance their hormones and heal their gut, specifically their gut lining, try the carnivore diet for four five, maybe six weeks and see how you feel. Amazing. Agreed. I love that. So we get a lot of questions about intermittent fasting, both here on Feeling Forward and also on our different platforms and Clubhouse and Instagram. What are your thoughts on intermittent fasting and speak specifically to women as well? 
Yes. So intermittent fasting is just like keto. Every single one of our ancestors did keto and fasting. So they're both, they're not new, these diets and protocols. They're just nuanced. So fasting is such an incredible tool. When we think about the human body, I, I say in my book, Keto Flex, that there's three rules to follow if you want to heal your body. Number one, identify the interference. Number two, remove the interference. And number three, allow your body to heal. It sounds simple, but it's a little bit more difficult when you're actually in the trenches. But when we, how do we incorporate fasting into this? Well, a lot of people, big interference is eating too frequently. And if you're eating too frequently, even if it's healthy, you're going to raise glucose and insulin throughout the day. And if you do that in short amount of time, acute situations, totally fine. But you do that for years, you're going to develop insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes and other disorder disorders out there, weight loss resistance, et cetera. So fasting, we are designed to feast, eat healthy, and to fast, feast famine cycles. Every single one of our 70 trillion cells are designed to do this. One of my favorite benefits of fasting, you mentioned it earlier, is cell autophagy. Autophagy, the Greek definition of autophagy is eat thyself. Eat thyself. It sounds like a weird thing, but it's actually super cool. And it's the innate intelligence within the body that does this. The innate intelligence, by the way, is this inner physician, this inner healer that we have inside of our 70 trillion cells that is eager to work for us. And there's no doctor, there's no pill, there's no surgery, there's no shot that could replace what the innate intelligence could do for us. And fasting is one of the best ways to harness and activate the innate intelligence. And here's a perfect example. So autophagy, when you're in a fasted state, let's say you're doing a 16 hour, 18 hour fast, you just have water, you're not eating food energy, the body, the innate intelligence starts to think, oh, we are going through a famine. We need to do some things to upregulate autophagy, which is this pathway and start working on the junk inside of the body. The body doesn't know about Uber Eats or DoorDash or the supermarket. It just automatically goes into the state. So now autophagy is turned on and the body is looking for cells, proteins, mitochondria, fats that are damaged, inflamed, and it starts to use that for energy. It starts to eat it, like eat thyself. The analogy is this. If, if you opened up your refrigerator and you see all these groceries inside of your refrigerator, what do they all have in common? They all have an expiration date on them. What would happen if you let all the groceries inside of your refrigerator expire, but instead of taking them out of the fridge and throwing them into the trash, you kind of just push them towards the back of the fridge, buy new groceries, put them in front of the old groceries and close that door. That's going to be nasty. There's going to be disease that will develop in that refrigerator. The human body is like that refrigerator. Out of the 70 trillion cells in the body, about 70 billion of them are expiring every day. They have an expiration date and the body needs to recycle them, clean them out. And that's what autophagy does. The innate intelligence goes within the cells and it starts to observe, okay, this mitochondria, these mitochondria, they're inflamed. They're not producing energy well. Let's start working on it and cleaning it out. It's like an intracellular Pac-Man cleaning out your cells. And that's activated during autophagy. And it's so powerful for preventing disease. Cancer is number one or number two, it kind of goes back and forth. But number one or number two, this a killer in the US with heart disease, they're back and forth. And it's estimated, according to the CDC, one in two men will be diagnosed with cancer during their lifetime. And for women, one in three women. I mean, how disgusting are those stats? Well, how could fasting help with that? Autophagy. There is a world-renowned doctor. His name is Dr. Thomas Seafried, who's from Boston College. He wrote the book, Cancer as a Metabolic Disease. And he said, if you completed a seven-day water-only fast once per year, you would reduce your risk of cancer by 95%, okay? And that's because of this maximum autophagy effect. So you get autophagy, it's estimated, it starts to turn on around the 16, 18 hour mark of a fast. The longer fast you do, the more autophagy you get. Your other question was, how do, you, how does, how do women do fasting versus men? Women should definitely do fasting differently than men and keto differently than men. You have different hormones. So let's talk about the, the menstruating women out there. If you have a monthly cycle and you're tracking it, which I do recommend you track it, the, the best time 
to not fast and actually not do keto and have more uh, three meals a day and higher carbs is the five to seven days right before your period. And the reason is because there's two hormones that are very low that week before your period, progesterone and estrogen. Progesterone is like the feel good hormone. Dr. Kerry Jones, my friend always says, it's the hormone that tells you everything is going to be okay. <laughs> and when you fast, when those hormones are already low, it leads to even more depletion of those hormones. So what happens? You get more anxiety. You might get more depression that week. You're definitely going to have more cravings. That's why a lot of women crave sugar and carbs and chocolate the week before their period. So what do you do? You just actually increase your carbohydrate intake, 100, 150 grams of healthy carbs per day. Don't do much fasting. And that's going to create an insulin spike that's going to help these hormones uh, increase and actually convert these hormones. So you're going to be more optimized and feel better. Now, once the period hits that day one full bleed, you go right back to fasting, right back to keto. So that's one variation there. Now, if you're postmenopausal, you still want to have maybe one day per week where you're not fasting, you're having more higher carbs, what I call flex day. So there's going to be important to follow the cycle of feasting and fasting. You don't want to do too much fasting. You don't want to do too much feasting. There's a proper balance in between these two uh, pathways, autophagy and something called mTOR. I love that. And we talked about mTOR in our episode with Dr. John Sautery. So if you guys want to go back and deep dive on that, we did two rounds, two episodes there. So take a listen oh, cool. to that um, back in the beginning. Very, very interesting what you said about the women that are cycling. Don't fast a week before, but then day one full bleed, it's okay to go back to fasting. I was always under the thoughts that the week of our period, we shouldn't fast because our body's in a high stress environment. It's going to increase cortisol and it would probably lead to some issues, but you're saying it's okay to fast during the period. Yeah. yeah. If you look at, if you look at, there's a, a 28 day chart that I have. Um, and I do in my lectures, it shows which hormones are up and down during that time of the month and they fluctuate. The best time that's going to, the best thing that's going to support your hormones that first week is going to be keto and fasting. Um, and if you do it the right way and have a higher healthy carbs the week before you, it's not going to be a stressful state for the body. It should be a very easy transition. Of course, I don't have a period, so I'm speaking for my <laughs> clients and the people I know and the doctors that I work with that are females, but it should be an easy transition with your cycle, not a whole bunch of pain, a whole bunch of cramps. So you're not in that stressful state. And that's where fasting could work for you that week. And I'm guessing in your newest book that just was released, Keto Flex, you probably have some pretty good schedules and plans to help with that, correct? Yeah, chapter 12 uh, is the chapter all about keto and fasting for women. And I have a week by week breakdown. So yeah, thank you for saying that. Beautiful. I'm sure listeners are like, wait, I need to figure this out. I need a schedule. I need a routine. I need something that's just easy that I can look at and plug into. Go check out the new Keto Flex book that was just released. You can find it on Amazon. Go right into chapter 12 for my women that are listening. And that'll help give you a lot of guidance and direction on how to start incorporating fasting into your day. Now, Ben, you're like one of the first people. I mean, I know that biohacking has been around for well over a decade, but you're one of the first people that really helped make it mainstream where it's really talked about. And you're constantly gaining more knowledge, going to these conferences. You were just at one this last weekend. Talk yeah. to us about the biohacking world and how you got into it, how you found it and what you're hearing right now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the biohacking world is fun. It's, it's very in vogue now. A lot of people are like, drinking bulletproof coffee and they're like, I'm a biohacker. <laughs> uh, there's different levels of biohacking. I mean, my definition of biohacking is simply a shortcut to success, to your health success in, in this specific scenario. Um, and everybody wants that. And in this day and age, there's so many cool gadgets and devices and things we can do to biohack our biology. So I love looking at the body from a cellular lens and anything I can do to help support my body at the cellular level I'm going to incorporate, I'll give you a few things that I do on a daily basis. That's considered biohacking. If you want to call it that red light therapy is terrific. I have um, right next to me, four big panels of red lights that I do every single morning. And, and sometimes in the evening as well, the scientific term for red light therapy is photobiomodulation. And what these far infrared and near infrared lights, red lights do, they're so um, small that they penetrate your cells and tell your mitochondria actually produce ATP, produce energy, 
It helps with your skin, so collagen production. It helps with gut health if you put it on your stomach and you have a stomach uh, problem. It could help with that. It'll help with soreness from a workout. You know, if you're super sore, put red light. So red light therapy is great. That's considered a biohack. I'm wearing blue light blocking glasses right now. They're not prescription what I'm wearing. They're just filtering out the blue light from the computer screen, which so my brain doesn't have to filter it out. And then at night I wear orange blue light blocking glasses, which then help my body produce melatonin and decrease cortisol. You know, one of the best biohacks that anybody can do that doesn't even require spending money is going outside and getting sunshine every single day. I mean, you don't have to live in Florida like me. You're in Arizona, right? Yeah, we have a lot of sunshine here. Yeah, <laughs> me too. But you don't have to be in these states that have a whole bunch of sunshine, a whole bunch of sunshine to get the benefits of the sun. You could it could be an overcast day, but that sun, getting your vitamin D up is going to be important. You talk about postpartum depression or anybody who's depressed, go outside for a walk. 30 minutes between the hours of sometime between like 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. when the sun's really out there. And it's going to help with your mood. It's going to help with vitamin D. Vitamin D is so important. It's not just a vitamin. It's a steroid hormone. It also helps with cholesterol, which is going to help with your sex hormones. And then I also interviewed a gentleman, Dr. Anthony J. from the Mayo Clinic. And he said, if you get your vitamin D levels above 50, 50, it's almost impossible to get a cytokine storm from COVID, okay? That's a very powerful statement from a smart man. So check your vitamin D levels. A lot of people are deficient. They're at 32. And on that lab report that your doctor gives to you with your result, it's gonna be 30 to 70, which is the reference range. So if you're 32, that's a deficiency, but your doctor would tell you, good job, you're in the range. That's not where we wanna be. Vitamin D should, I believe, over 60 to maybe even a hundred. There's no even upper toxicity limit for vitamin D. So that's a biohack, get some vitamin D. Uh, and then another biohack would be to hack your, your bedroom and make sure you have a good sleep environment because sleep is going to be so important. So a cold room, I use something called a chili pad, which is a uh, cooling mattress underneath my bed, which cools the bed, helps me get deep sleep. But biohacking is exploding. Dave Asprey is like the godfather of biohacking. That's whose conference I was just at this weekend. And a lot of people are loving it because they're starting to apply these biohacking tools and principles, and it's helping them get results in a short amount of time. And that's what it's all about, essentially. And I see you're wearing your aura ring there. So you're tracking your sleep yeah. as well and your, your heart rate and all of that. So a lot of people are struggling with sleep and it's because we have poor sleep hygiene. We don't have a good routine, the three plus hours leading up to when we want to get to bed, or we don't even have a consistent bedtime. So let's quickly touch on the topic of sleep and how to optimize sleep, talking about REM sleep versus deep sleep, et cetera. Yeah, you're, you're so right. Sleep is so important. It is, it is fundamental. It is the Swiss army knife of health because it'll help everything that you're doing. I see a lot of people struggle with keto and fasting, and I asked them, how's your sleep? Uh, oh, you know, I get like five hours. It's not that great. Well, you're, you're not going to get the results you want unless your sleep is optimized. In my book, Keto Flex, it's a keto book, but sleep is so important. I had to throw in a chapter on sleep because it is actually so essential to your health, to your mood, to fat burning. So we have four different stages of sleep. Two of them are really important. So REM sleep, which is rapid eye movement, and then deep sleep, which is Delta sleep. REM sleep is important because what that does is during this time that you're sleeping, when you're in the REM sleep stage of sleep, you're taking short-term memory and you're starting to process the, that short-term memory for long-term memory. So that's going to help with brain fog. That's going to help with remembering people's names, just focus and clarity. I aim to get around an hour and a half of REM sleep every night. And I track that with my aura ring. Then you have deep sleep. Deep sleep is super cool. This is when your body's raising growth hormone and other fat burning hormones. So your body's burning a lot of fat during deep sleep, but also the brain is literally shrinking in size uh, up to 60%. And you have this cerebral spinal fluid that now flushes over the brain via this process called the glymphatic system. And it's kind of like this dishwasher fluid that's flushing out accumulated uh, toxins and plaques and proteins uh, during this period of sleep, your body is detoxifying its brain. So you wake up feeling like a rock star when you get enough deep sleep. So I get about two hours of deep sleep each night. And, and that's the goal for me. I use the aura ring, like you mentioned, which is a great way to track your sleep. Uh, o-u-r-a ring.com. I have no affiliation with them, but they're amazing. 
Uh, it tells you how much deep sleep you're getting, REM sleep. It also gives you your heart rate variability, which is a great thing to look at, determining how much stress you have in your life. So that's a great biohacking tool. It's one of my favorites. And then one more is a CGM is a, another amazing biohacking tool, which is a continuous glucose monitor you wear. It's like a patch and it gives you 24 seven idea of what's going on with your glucose. So I had to throw that one in there as well. That's incredible. And I need to know how you get two hours of deep sleep a night, because I mean, the average person is getting like 30 minutes, an hour on a good night, maybe an hour 15. How are you getting to that two hour mark is, are you accrediting that to the chili pad? What else are you doing? There's a lot of things that I've been doing over the years to biohack my sleep. Uh, it's the red light therapy, but one of the best things you can do that's very easy is getting sunlight in the morning when the sun comes up. So that'll sync your, your hormones with the cir cir circadian rhythm. So getting sunlight in the morning is what I do. I walk my dog as I do my affirmations, as the sun comes up, that starts to signal to your, your body, your pineal gland to start storing melatonin for the night up ahead. And then getting sunset sunshine is also a great idea. That'll now signal to your pineal gland. Okay. We're now transitioning to nighttime and then your pineal gland will start releasing that melatonin. So that's essential. I do that. Red light therapy has helped keeping my room cold. 65 degrees Fahrenheit is where studies show you get that good deep sleep. The chili pad, I set it at 65 degrees as well, because that's where the studies show. And that's a good spot for me. I have a great mattress. I mean, it's a very expensive mattress, but uh, it does a great job. It's non-toxic. It's a really high quality mattress. I wear my blue blocking glasses at night. I avoid any kind of like mental stimulation at nighttime. I'm not watching the news. I mean, don't watch the news in general, but I'm not watching the news at night, watching something lighthearted. And I have, a, like you said, a sleep hygiene routine. My body knows I rarely stay out past 10 PM unless it's like, a, you know, I'm at a conference or whatever, but my body starts to get tired at 9 PM. It knows go to bed at nine 30. And by the way, one last tip here is that there's something called money time sleep window. And it's, it's estimated that one hour of sleep within this window is equivalent to two hours of sleep outside of this window when it comes to deep sleep. And that is roughly between the hours of 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. So if you could prioritize getting to bed by 10 a.m., you will get more of this deep sleep. So that's the goal. Get to sleep by 10 p.m. during that money time sleep window so we can get even more of that deep sleep. Interestingly enough, someone just asked me last week, what is a good mattress? And I was like, I, I, I don't know. I think they're all good. You got to kind of go test them out and see what works for you. What's your favorite mattress? What do you recommend? Yeah, they're, they're not all um, created equal. Uh, there's a lot of great mattresses out, out there that are doing a good job marketing their mattresses and it has some cool functions, but they use toxic materials that we actually breathe in <laughs> eight hours a night or so, which could lead to problems in the body. So I've done a lot of research on mattresses over the years. I use a company called Organics Bed, uh, organicsbed.com slash keto camp, I think goes to my affiliate page with them, but it's non-toxic. It's super comfortable. They have this a specific design that's a mesh uh, in the mattress that um, there's no metal, so it doesn't attract EMFs, but the mesh uh, 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 helps somebody who wants a harder mattress or a softer mattress. It actually meets you in the middle. So I use Organics Bed. It's been a game changer for my sleep. Awesome. So we're going to have to look into that because we're hearing all about the sleep number mattresses and the purple mattresses and the memory foam mattresses. And I'm like, I don't know, just whatever <laughs> feels comfortable, but I know we're, we're due for a mattress over here at the Loesch residence. So oh, thank there you, you go. That. We'll look into that <laughs> organicsbed.com backslash keto camp. Take a look yeah. at it, my friends. Okay. Let's go back a couple of steps. There's a major, major issue going on out there with the way people are processing stress and anxiety, and it's through emotional eating. We're reaching for food to help us with our feelings and our thoughts. And a lot of us are highly addicted to sugar, sugar in the form of carbohydrates, in the form of rice, bread, candy, chocolate. I mean, you name it. So let's deep dive into this topic because it's leading to obesity. It's leading to insulin resistance. It's leading to depression. It's leading to so many issues. Let's talk about it and how to break a sugar addiction. I've been there. I was addicted to sugar for several years. I kept looking for the answers in my fridge, but the answer is not in your fridge. The answer is in, within you. Uh, it's an inside out job, just like happiness. Happiness is an inside out job. So there's an interesting, interesting thing about addiction. And I have a kind of a different viewpoint than some of the experts out there. 
my viewpoint on addiction is that there's a lot of energy in addiction. I, I remember, I've, I've, I've always been told I have an addictive personality. And anytime I have an addiction, uh, I put a lot of energy into it. For example, when I was a kid, I used to play a lot of video games. I was addicted to video games and I was one of the best video game players in the entire world. I used to win cash tournaments, go to, I used to own people in video games. But that, I mean, I, that's not something I want to put my energy into because it's, it's not healthy for me or for the world, essentially. So that transferred into a sugar addiction eventually and a drug addiction. So what, what helped me get out of that was getting clear on my why, my highest values, and then my purpose, essentially, and then living on purpose with my purpose. What that would mean for me was to get first what's important to me. And then I started to align my daily activities with what's important to me. And slowly but surely, I started to break away from those addictions. And what I did was transferred that energy into something that was actually healthier for me and healthier and serving to the world. Uh, so now I'm obsessed. You could call it an addiction. I'm obsessed with research. I'm obsessed with studying. I'm obsessed with having conversations like this. I'm obsessed with educating and lecturing. And it's my highest value. But I've, tr you know, I've transferred that energy into something that was really important to me. A lot of people who are suffering with addiction, they have a void within them that they believe can be uh, the solution is going to be sugar or carbohydrates to fill that void. But the problem is that it's a dopamine short term fix that will lead to more frustration and more addiction. The solution to overcome it for good is to find out what is important to you and then start to align your calendar and live on purpose with your purpose. I know that blank space on the calendar of somebody who has an addiction is the devil's playground. Okay. And that's going to be your environment. You're going to have to do an audit on your environment because people will peer pressure you into having that addiction. If you think about it, it's so crazy. If you have a sugar addiction and you go to a Thanksgiving dinner and you have, you know, your, your aunt or your mom saying, have the apple pie, you know, and they get offended if you don't have it. Don't they understand that this is an addiction and sugar is like a drug, but it's socially acceptable to give somebody sugar, give somebody carbohydrates, even though we know they have a problem. But if that same mom or grandma or aunt said, just have a little bit of some co cocaine, you know, it's okay. You know, that's a problem, right? Why don't we say the same thing for sugar? If somebody has an issue, the family should be, should be supportive, but that's your job to communicate that to them. Look, I have new goals for myself. I have new priorities and, I, and these, this is something that has led to a problem for me. So please, if you could support me and help me overcome this addiction. So have those conversations. And if they're not willing to help you, you got to cut them out of your life, at least until you overcome the addiction, but you can overcome it and you can overcome it in a short amount of time. Keto could help, more protein could help, and sleep is going to be a big thing for you as well. Sleep is pivotal. Increasing the protein, increasing the fat, getting yourself to that state of ketosis will really help you just with resetting your metabolism, teaching your body how to use fat for fuel and breaking that need for carbohydrates for fuel and energy. Because oftentimes it's like you said, it's this, this vicious cycle of you eat sugar, you get that dopamine hit and then it wears off. And then you want that hit again, because the dopamine makes you feel good. Now I want to go back sugar addiction. Oftentimes it's not just attached to stress, but it's oftentimes attached to depression. And when I'm thinking about depression from my own experience and how I felt when I was depressed and a lot of people that I talk to, it's hard to find your why when you're at your lowest point, it's hard to know what is my purpose. So what do you do for that individual? That's really, really struggling to even get themselves out of bed to brush their teeth. How can we help them find their why? Cause they have the awareness that there's a problem, but how do we give them their larger calling to help pull them out of it? Very great, great question. The best thing you could do is hire a coach. Hire somebody who could see the greatness in you and pull it out of you. If that's something that's not doable right now, uh, for whatever reasons, then the next thing you can do is get a book. There's a great book that I'm thinking about right now that helped me determine my highest values. It's actually called The Values Factor by Dr. John Martini, And there's exercises in there. But here are some things to consider. What can you do? What do you do on a daily basis that's productive that nobody has to tell you to do? That usually leads to 
your highest values. Now, on the opposite end, what are you doing on a daily basis that you have to be forced to do, pushed to do, that you are complaining about? That's on your lowest values, probably. So start to do more things that you don't have to be reminded to do. That could be, I don't know, going for a workout. That could be reading a book. Uh, that could be playing your guitar. I mean, do more of the things that are important to you. Start to align those actions even more and more every single day in your calendar. So the best thing is to hire a coach who can help you do that. Secondly, I would read that book, The Values Factor by Dr. John Martini. It's a process, and I don't expect you to figure all this out in day one, and we shouldn't go big or go home. I think that's a bad approach. We should just get 1% better every single day. And don't look at your environment. Don't look at somebody else and start comparing yourself to them and their lives or their social media highlight reel. The only person you should compare yourself to is the person you were yesterday, the thoughts you thought yesterday, the actions you took yesterday. If you can just get a little bit better, the small keys will unlock big doors and you have it stack. And eventually you're going to overcome this for good. So beautifully said, you guys, if you're loving this conversation, if you're loving this information, if you're loving just the place that Ben is speaking from, it's from a place of love. Like if you're watching this episode on YouTube, you can see that when he speaks, he's illuminating light. He is really joyous and sharing this information, this knowledge over 13 years of research that he's done, not just in biohacking himself, but in helping and helping so many clients and friends and family members along the way. If you're loving this info, go and grab his new book, Keto Flex, because he's really breaking it down, talking about the keto diet, talking about fasting, talking about hormones, talking about all the things in a beautiful book. And he's a best-selling author of many other books as well. The power of sleep. He also created an intermittent fasting cheat sheet and the perfect health booklet. So check out his books, grab keto flex and follow him on Instagram because he's posting incredible content every single day. Check out keto camp, Ben Azadi on Instagram and stay in touch with him because he is, I mean, he's amazing. Ben, you're incredible. I appreciate you so much, my friend. I appreciate you, Nico. You, amazing interview. Uh, you did a really great job with it. Uh, can I share one more thing? Please. I was going to say, do you have any closing remarks or anything else that you can leave our feeling forward audience with? Because a lot of us that are listening, we're feeling forward. A lot of us are women that are dealing with postpartum depression. A lot of us are new to this functional medicine side of fixing our health. We've been going to doctors and taking medication. Now we're saying enough is enough. We're learning about cell autophagy. We're learning about fasting. We're learning about a different way of doing things, supplements, short-term, not long-term. So can you speak to our audience on anything you want to talk about that can add value? Yes. The final thing I want to share is that when you think about the word success, there's a different definite. Everybody has a different definition of it. I'm going to share my favorite definition of success And I learned this from Earl Nightingale, who is the pioneer of the self-development movement back in the 1950s. He said, success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. That word ideal, that means an idea, a goal that you have fallen in love with. And success is the progressive realization towards that goal. Meaning you find something that's important to you, you set a goal. And as long as you're closing the gap between where you are right now and where the goal is, as long as you're closing the gaps, the progressive realization, you're taking actions towards that, you're going to be happier and you're successful. But when you quit on that goal that's important to you, that's when actually failure does exist. But if you keep pushing forward, fail forward, then you turn that uh, failure into a stepping stone. You turn that obstacle into an opportunity. So find that ideal, your goal that you love, and progressively work towards that. That ideal could be being the best mother in the world for your kids. As long as you're working towards that, you're successful. That could be being the best baseball player in the world. That could be being the best keto educator in the world. That could be educating a billion people, which is my goal. As long as it's not about hitting the goal, it's about closing the gap and the people you need to help, the relationships you create along the way. It's who you become on your way towards that goal, not hitting that goal. So as long as I am closing that gap, I'm happier, I'm healthier, I'm loving. But when I, if I ever stop closing that gap, then I'm going to find myself complaining and leading to bad habits. And the final thing I share is a quick story about what life is going to do to us because life, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. So there's a story about a donkey in a small little town 
this town had several donkeys, but one of these donkeys fell into a well in the town. This well was not working. It was dried out. The donkey fell into the well and it was down deep inside the well and it was screaming for help. So all the people in the village gathered together and they're thinking they're trying to get the donkey out, but it's too far down there. So they start to strategize. What are we going to do here? Well, they wanted to close, seal off that well for months because there was no use for it. And the donkey was pretty old. So they were like, let's just cut our losses and make sure no other donkeys fall in there. So they all grabbed shovels. And this is life. Life is grabbing a shovel. And they're starting to now dump dirt inside of the well as that donkey is screaming for help. And they're just dumping dirt like life is dumping dirt on us. And all of a sudden, silenced. The donkey is quiet, but they just keep dumping dirt keep dumping dirt. Minutes later, they see the head of the donkey come up out of the well, jump out and run away because they kept dumping dirt on the donkey. The donkey rubbed it off, took a step up. Dirt hit the shoulder, took a step up. So when life throws dirt on your shoulder, take a step up like that donkey, keep failing forward. And on the opposite end is that world of health, abundance, love, and joy. And that's my final message for you. Amen. Such a beautiful message. And I love that, that visual, because in life, we're all going to be faced with challenges. We're all going to be faced with trials and tribulations, allow those to be the forces that help propel you forward towards your why that help you find your truest, best, strongest self. And it's through the overcoming the victory of that challenge that was thrown your way for a reason, right? I firmly believe that I'm also a believer that God would never put me through something that he firmly knew I couldn't overcome. So every challenge I know is for a reason is to help amplify. It's to help strengthen and it's to help give us more courage, more passion, more love, and more connection. And as long as you can see it as an opportunity to up level, my friends, you're in the right place. Continue to fail forward and continue to love and to learn and connect. In your closing statement on your email, you had another quote by Earl Nightingale that I wanted to share. And it says, most people tiptoe through their, their tiptoe their way through life, hoping to make it safely to death. Mm. My friends stop tiptoeing. There's no need to tiptoe, find your why, find your love. And maybe Ben share with us, what is your love? What is your why? And maybe this will help give someone inspiration to find theirs. Yeah. Thank you. That, that quote is so powerful. I always remind myself because I was tiptoeing my way through life for 24 years, hoping to land safely on death's door. A lot of people think they, they, a lot of people don't understand that they are the movie star. They're the director of their own movie. A lot of people think they're the extra in their own movie, but you're the superstar and you want to find what's important to you. So to answer your question, what's important to me is education, researching and sharing my research on interviews like this in my books. The overall goal is to educate and to inspire a billion people, to wake them up, to help them understand that they're incredible, their body could heal, and here's how you do so. And as long as I work towards that with interviews like this and get closer to that, I'm happy and I consider myself successful. I love it. I love it. I love it. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful share. I love your heart. I love your mission. And I love that I even got some clarity as you were saying what your true joy is. It's not just necessarily to be like the health detective of just keto and just talk keto all day. It's to learn, to continue to gain knowledge, to continue to surround yourself with people that are doing the things that you want to do, right? Rubbing shoulders with them, reading books, stimulating your brain, and then sharing that knowledge, which helps give you connection, which we all need connection right now. And that's going to help us in our lives. Ben Azadi, thank you so much for being on the Failing Forward podcast. My friends, go ahead and check him out. You can go to www.benazadi.com. We'll be leaving all the links to his social media as well in the show notes and grab a copy of his newest book, Keto Flex, and start your biohacking journey today. Thank you all so much. We'll see you on another episode very soon. 